We need to get together and let our voices be heard. This is Buffalo What's Next. I'm Jay Moran. I'm Bridget Jaipal Valenza. I'm Dave Debo. And I'm Thomas O'Neill White. After May 14th, how can we afford not to talk about race? About education, about segregation, about humanity. Since the dawn of this nation, racial violence has existed. The way we have designed our society has a big hand in what occurred in that Topps market. The suburban area everywhere, we must work and teach our children. We need to make sure that we put more funding in our programs that help prevent gun violence and more money into art. If we're going to have some real healing. We've got to have space to tell some uncomfortable truths. And with us on Buffalo What's Next, a discussion about the Providence Farm Collective. Uh, with us, Hamadi Ali. He is the markets manager and also Dal Kamara. He is the uh, community engagement coordinator. Gentlemen, thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a lot to talk about, but first I want to talk about maybe what happened this year at the Providence uh, Farm uh, Collective. It, the, the farm itself is a, a beautiful stretch of, uh, of land out in the Orchard Park area. How much land is out there? Uh, about 37 acres of land. Okay. All farmed? No. Okay. About 25 acres farmed. All right. Yes. And it's interesting because there are, the farmers consist of people from different ethnicities, people of different origins, right? Right. How does that work? Uh, so we have nine different communities that farm at Providence Farm Collective namely the Somali Bantus, the Liberians, the Burundis, the Karenis, uh, the Myanmar's, uh, the Burmese, we have uh, the African Americans, the Congolese, uh, Ethiopians, so nine different communities that we have that farm there and each community has their own farm and we also we have an incubator farm program, and the incubator farmers come from all these communities. So in each of these communities, a lot of what they're producing are, how do we, what's the term, uh, ethnic, um, uh, ethnically sensitive types of products, is that right? Yes, and culturally relevant foods. Okay. Yes. So you have the Congolese. They grow what they call the African eggplant. Uh, uh, there are a lot of, there are varieties of African eggplants that are smaller than the typical Italian or the traditional eggplant. They're a little bitter, uh, very white, some are yellow, some are purple, grown by the Congolese and the Liberians. The Somali Bantu grow the African maize uh, which grows taller than the typical sweet corn. And we grow amaranth. Uh, Roselle, I think it's grown by the Burmese. And what else that is unique? We grow amaranth. And amaranth, I think it's popular now in the U.S. with uh, uh, health, health or nutrition right. conscious people. Uh, but when we came... Uh, well, I'll go back a little bit. Sure. A lot of Americans use the grains, but uh, most of the Africans that consume this or the immigrants, they eat the leaves. And a lot of Americans didn't know that. They only know that you can consume the grains. Okay. But we have introduced Americans, hey, no, you could eat the leaves and are edible and tasty. So there, we have these different communities growing their produce mm -hmm. out at uh, Providence. Uh, do they is, are they doing it for their own use or is it to be sold? Well, for the communities, it's for both. Okay, they grow to consume, and they're not obligated to sell. The incubator farmers. So we have two programs. Right. The incubator farmers. These are small business. We are teaching them how to operate a small farm business. Find markets for them. They can sell, and they can also consume some, but we encourage them to sell and learn how to sell on their own. The communities, it's up to them. They can either consume or sell. And when it comes to communities, you know, Dow, this is, I guess, it comes to you. How do you go about finding people who are interested in, in doing this? 
Um, we we spread the word. Okay. Spread the word. Go down speaking engagement and talk more about Providence Farm Collective, especially from my community. Um, we got involved with Providence Farm Collective through a church. We were in the church, and one of the our church member got in contact with the farm director Beth, and uh, and Beth told her that uh, look, we have a space that you know, if you guys want to farm. Believe it or not, we've been looking for a place to farm for over 10 to 15 years and don't have access to farmland because f- farming is our way of life. And uh, when we got the information from a member of the church who said, I got a testimony, hmm. and we thought it was something different, and she said, guess what? I just got a call from Providence Farm Collective that they got a farmland for us to farm. That was the end of the church. Everybody was everybody jubilated. We all were happy, and we get in our cars. We found our way straight to East Aurora to go meet Providence Farm Collective. That's how it started. So when we learn from there, we begin to spread the word. So from one community to another community, from one community to another community, community start coming in. But there's a process. You have to fill out an application and go through an interview to see how dedicated and committed you're going to be to the program, and uh, you'll be able to continue the farming. That's that's how we get communities coming in. And it's interesting, you mentioned uh, East Aurora Dow. Of course, that was the former location of, uh, of the Providence uh, Farm. Uh, it has since moved uh, to Orchard Park. Uh, how much better is this land in Orchard Park than what you were utilizing initially? Oh, my God. The land we own right now is a miracle land. Because uh, the first time we went to East Aurora, personally for myself, I put in almost tons of hours, and we did not realize nothing good from the soil because the soil was not... That prime soil, you know, that good for us to grow the kind of crops we wanted to grow. Especially the crops that we take from Africa is very sensitive to weather. So we really did not realize what we needed. That year we, we actually got 23,000 pounds of food uh, produced from there. But when we make our recommendation to our executive director, Christine, and uh, we the advisory board said, look, can you find somewhere better? So you know, she went on the move. We don't know how the miracle happened. We know she know that. But... Out of a sudden, they said, oh, no, we found somewhere else. Come and check it out. So we went out to check on, on Button Row. And when we got to Button Row the first year, we produced 91,000 pounds of food. So that's the difference between the 23 and the 91,000. And this year, I know we double it again because the farm is so good that, that we call home now. And we also need to point out that, like you call it a miracle, but the miracle does come with a, a price that I want to get into in terms of the, the capital uh, effort here for Providence. But I don't want to... Uh, I want to keep that off in the distance here for just a little bit. I want to also, if I could, uh, Dow, talk just a little bit about your journey to here. Um, I mentioned this before we went on the air. <laughs> Dow looks like he could be in his, uh, he could be 20, and uh, he is not 20. He is considerably older. Yeah. Uh, Dow, uh, tell us about coming to Buffalo. Um, again, I told you I'm from Liberia, West Africa, and uh, I left my country because of a civil war that actually took place. And because of the civil war, uh, um, I seek refuge in the nearby country called the Ivory Coast, where I spent 13 years in the in the, uh, in the refugee camp. And being in the refugee camp, I had no access to farmland. I lost my way of life and lost my tradition. Even lost other family members who mm. actually I don't know where they were. So when I spent all those years in the refugee camp, I lived on handout. Because I couldn't grow the food I used to eat. I couldn't have access to my own cultural food. Because once ever you leave your land and you find yourself into foreign land, you don't have access to your tradition and to, to the land you used to have. And your way of life has been hijacked because you don't have a choice. So I had to live in a refugee camp with poor education and spend my young uh, whole life and go to refugee school until I got resettled by the resettlement team to come to the United States. And when I came to the United States 2003. When I came to the United States, I decided to go to Erie Community College. And uh, when the Erie Community College, I went to Ball State and I went to UB. And I become a community organizer and serve as community leaders. And since then, I've been pretty much the kind of basic guy in my community until I have to make profit, I have made Provident Farm Collective. and. The more I met Provident Farm Collective, the more empowered I become now that I can reach out not just to the Liberian community, but all the different communities and create a network and relationship that we can make our community better. And that's my story. That's the journey. And one part of the story that you didn't mention right there is that 
farming has been your life. Yeah. You farmed from an early age in uh, Liberia? Yes. Yeah, since I born when my eye was open to life, it's only farming was the way of life. I go to school through farming. I got close through farming. Everything I did was farming. My mother was not a kind of educated person, so all she taught me is how to farm. So I grew up as a little boy being a farmer and a best friend to my mom because she always carried me every morning, and that was the teaching process for me. But as I began to grow up as a young boy, I began to develop interest in farming. So I said, look, I think I got to learn agriculture. <laughs> so I went in the field of agriculture to kind of have a variety of knowledge on what really it means you know, to, to be farming. And I did that, uh, and I got my degree, in my undergraduate degree in, um, in agriculture before coming. But uh, when I get to the United States and I don't have access to farmland, I just said, look, let me forget about this degree. Like, I have to go back to school. <laughs> yeah. So I went and learned something else until I have to meet Providence Farm Collective again that I have to come back to what I learned from, from, my, from, my, from, my, from my early age. So now with everything I do at Providence Farm Collective, I'm a farmer, I'm a community leader, as a sitter, I'm a community engagement person at Providence Farm Collective. I was going to ask this. So you're still farming. Oh, yes. And uh, you're producing... Uh, things that you produce in Liberia? Oh, yes. Right Example. Now, yeah, right now I'm producing three different type of eggplants. Oh. Yeah, three different type of eggplants that uh, you really don't know, and I'm trying to, we're trying to introduce it in Western New York. And uh, Provident Farm is working on this recipe that uh, whatever we produce, it can come to the market and have a recipe so people can know how to do it. So we produce the first, the real eggplant called the African eggplant. And we produce the one you guys call garden egg. It's a still African airplane. And we produce another type of airplane we call the kettle. And those things are very good for health because from where I came from, food is medicine. So <laughs> so, so you see us. Somebody is say, that why you look like yeah, you're 20? I look 50, but I look 20 because <laughs> okay. the kettle is helping me and the bit of is helping me. And that recipe needs to get to the market so you guys can you know, get used to it. So doctor is not my friend. The food are my friends. Forget the question of food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> From the Providence Farm Collective with us uh, on Buffalo What's Next, we have Dal Kamara and Hamadi Ali. Uh, Hamadi, your job then is to try to put this all together and get it to to markets. Yes. What What about that? How How does that go on, go on for you? Well, it's going well so far. Uh, last year when... Uh, we started, we only had uh, 18 members in our CSA uh, program. Uh, CSA stands for Community Supported Agriculture. And we were only in one market, uh, a couple of markets. Okay. Yes. And also we had this uh, grant from the Buffalo Bills Foundation, aggregation um, grant, where we can aggregate produce from our farmers and sell it, uh, not sell it, donate it to food pantries. So we were able to partner with um, uh, uh, Westside Community Services, Community Action Organization, uh, the Friends of the Night people, and um, the Salvation Army on Grant Street. Okay. Uh, so going back to markets this year, we were able to expand our CSA program to a 43 members program. That is almost, it doubled, not right. almost, it exactly doubled. Um, we were able to get into other markets. And another market I forgot that we are in, we partnered with Feed More of Western New York. Yes. So, and also this year we were able to uh, start our farmer's market on Buffalo's How did west that go? How did side. It, go? it was beautiful. Uh, First, when I started, I was like, is this going to work? And to the last day, we had folks come there early morning saying, oh, today's the last day. That's sad. We came to just get our last, you know, shares. But throughout the summer, it, it was just beautiful. That's, that's it, great to it, hear. It was beautiful. And your produce now is also in other stores as well. Yes. Uh, we were able to get into Lexington Co-op in both of their locations, one in Hurdle and the other one on Elmond. Okay. Yes, and I've been very supportive. And that uh, proved to be uh, prosperous uh, for for the, the collective? I mean, did it worked out well in terms of uh, yes. how, much, how much money you were able to, to take in? Yes, it worked very well. 
and our farmers were able to sell more produce and earn that uh, extra income for themselves. Yeah, so it worked very well. And uh, Is there any idea, like you said, you have the incubator program, mm -hmm. how much, what kind of value their, their produce was worth this year? Do we have that? I, mean, I know you have it in terms of pounds, but do we actually have a, a dollar figure attached, or is that maybe too hard to calculate? Uh, it's not too hard to calculate. I have done rough numbers. Okay. Yeah, and, and our I see the I see the twinkle uh, in your eye, so I guess you do have that uh, ready for me. Yeah, uh, I have <laughs> yes, and uh, I think our farmers did very well because from last year to this year, when I compared the I can't remember exactly what the numbers were. Sure. But it all it tripled, tripled. from what someone sold last year to this year. The same person it tripled and I went after everyone else and it seemed like everyone else either doubled or tripled their sales. Wow. Yeah. And this is because of the markets that we were able to get in and the farmers market. And also one more market that we are in, it's the Delavan Grider Community Center. It is a fairly new farmers market that was started because of the the tragedy that happened on the east side and Dow has been manning that for us. Uh, every other Thursday, I think it started in September, and it will end in uh, December. Oh, it's still going on. It's still going on. Yeah. When when it's at, it's the Delavan Grider Community Center. When what day of the week? Uh, it's Thursday. I was there last Thursday from four to seven. Okay. Yeah, and, and it go pretty well. Yeah. 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 What about since uh, Hamadi brought it up, and you you guys now are you're Buffalonians, right? You know, um, what about Buffalo since? what happened on Jefferson Avenue uh, on May 14th. How, have you seen a change in Buffalo? Um, maybe, but uh, I got it for me. Uh, I spend all my time at Providence Farm Collective now. <laughs> <laughs> so you're busy. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm my family because the reason, uh, the reason I said it is because you want somewhere where you can ease your stress, where you can be able to have folks to talk to you, Still being around Buffalo and have no uh, counseling, have no one meeting committees. Because if you if you look at what has happened on the east side, it's not just the family, but we as a neighbor and as a community, we all are affected. And when we are affected, there should be the round table where we have to sit down and actually discuss what the future holds for every one of us. What is the solution? What can we do to avoid this? How can we be one another brother's keepers? If we don't have such a conversation, it like somebody just say, let's just forget about them. They gotta figure out the way. And I think getting into my route and doing my farming with my family, you know, having our, you know, our conversation, that, that help us to ease, to ease our stress. But Buffalo need to improve. <laughs> we really need to improve. When such a tragedy happens, let us understand that we all are neighbor, we all are affected. How can we come on the table? Each community should have a seat on the table to be able to address the issue. Yeah. You brought it up. How sh how should Buffalo improve? Any thoughts? Uh, well, on improvement, but even before improvement, um, the whole beginning of PFC, it started with uh, the Somali Bantu. When we first arrived, we were settled in on the east side and the west side of Buffalo. And if I was a young man, but just looking the, of the divide, seeing how the east side and the west side were, I'm like, why is this? This is America. People are supposed to be together. People are supposed to work together. But divide the divide was so huge. And as Dow mentioned in his uh, story or his history. I come almost from the same background. I'm from Somalia. When the Civil War broke out, my family moved to Kenya. I was a young boy, but all I knew was farming. They came to the States after seeing how the city of Buffalo was divided. It's like, well, I need to get connected to my roots. I went to school to ECC, like Dow, Buff State, and eventually to UB. <laughs> and I got, in, you know, I engaged with my community. How can I help my community? And one thing I was like, hell, we 
come from a farming, a great, uh, agrarian farmers, subsistence farmers. But I want to change that. But how do we get land? And I, st- me and others, the whole community, will start reaching out. This has to change because the divide, the segregation, something has to change. And the first thing to change is to get access to fresh food. The food stores that were around oh, by the time I was living on West Ferry, it's either two miles going whatever way uh, Harlow or uh, uh, East Ampress was, or maybe coming towards downtown to reach the other food store. There was no other food store nearby. We had to walk. It's like, this is sad for the folks that live here. It's what they call now the food apathy. Right. Uh, so you yes. said, I mean, you saw this. Uh, so uh, you saw this a long time. Time ago. ago. Yeah. And that's how we start reaching out. And like Dow alluded, it took a long time. It took us from 2007 to 2017 to get land to farm on. Ten years. We got on. We got the land. We start farming, and we start asking the questions: Who should this food go to? Well, ourselves and the communities in Buffalo that need fresh food. So things don't happen in vacuum. What happened on May 14th has to do with all of this: the divide in Buffalo, and that has to change. Leaders have to engage. What do their people want? What do their people need? How you can educate the people? You say, uh, things just don't happen. The people that live in these neighborhoods, you go to a store, you shoot the store, which is um, very unfortunate, and then the store is closed. People have nowhere to turn to to go get food. And as sad as it is, it was fortunate that there were some organizations that were willing to give food. One of it was the community action organization, which uh, PFC was donating food to and pfc stepped up like hey how can we help how can we do this how much food did you uh contribute i have i don't have the numbers but it was a lot yeah yes every tuesday morning we made sure that we loaded our truck and drove to the east side on east ferry uh, community organization center and delivered the produce Uh, fresh produce harvested on monday delivered on tuesday morning Wow. No chemical, no pesticides. Clean. Grown right here? Grown right here in Western New York. Western New York. Yes. Uh, We're coming down to our uh, final few minutes here, talking about the Providence Farm Collective um, with Hamadi Ali and Dow Kamara. Um, What about that? I think you've got, both of you gentlemen have done a great job of talking about the value and what the possibility of this is. But yet, at the same time, I did touch upon this, Dow, a little bit. Like you said, we started off on East, in East Aurora. Somebody was kind enough to, to let you use some land. It wasn't really ideal for growing. You've got this place in Orchard Park now where you can grow. But there is a cost with that as well. What can you tell us? What, what, do, what should we know about, about uh, this effort that's moving forward here? Yeah, and I think that's what I'm here called it. What next? What's next? What next? And... Right now, we have Providence Farm Collective and the Western New York Land Conservancies. We raised about two point three million, and within the three two point three million, we have six hundred and eighty five thousand that actually go towards purchasing the land and protection, and we have six hundred sixty five thousand that will go towards uh, infrastructure improvements, and we have seven hundred twenty five thousand that will go to our farm directly in domain. And so and sustainability, and uh, we also have uh, 141 thousand that go towards the campaign management, and we have uh, 110 thousand that go toward contingency. You see, um, but but currently our uh, Providence Farm Collective has secured 1.6 million. Okay, as we have right now, and at the same time, our uh, we have the March challenge of 275,000 that is, that is on our way. But at the result of the campaign, Provident Farm intend to actually provide uh, prime farm land and infrastructure assets and, and uh, educational support 
for both the farmers and the young, the young adults, which is the, uh, which we, in our after uh, our summer youth program, because of everything that's happening right now at the 37 acres of farmland. So the education will be able to educate 300 farmers and 50 uh, young people within the summer youth program as well. So that's the future. That's the future we have right now. But then at the same time, what are we looking at in 2024? In 2024, we are hoping that uh, both the farmer and the young people that are in the summer youth program, that in 2024 we can operate on 20, on 20 acre builders farm and 10 community farm, farm as, as well in 2024. And the reason we want to do that because we still need to address the food insecurity, both in the refugees, the immigrants, and a black individual who are actually facing food insecurity right. in, in Western New York. And even if you look at uh, the statistics of uh, the estimate of 200,000 children, 22% of those cases in their home are so struggling to be able to put food on their table. And the Group of Providence Farm Collective is, how can we make that process? How can we be able to address the food insecurity? So uh, we're still not stopping there for the future of Providence Farm Collective. What is on our way right now, from the operation of the farm, both the farmers and the youth, we're definitely looking at uh, how can our farmers get income and how can our youth get income. So we're looking at uh, within this program, farmer might be able to earn 45000 from their produce, and the youth can be able to earn over 100000 within the program from the youth program. And that money will be able to actually to address the food and housing insecurity. At the same time, they will be able to purchase school supplies. And other farmers will still use those farm to restudy their family members. And whatever funds are there will be able to address other community needs, like what we're talking about counseling and other services that will be able, you know, to be able to come, you know, to help the community too as well. So this is the feature that actually the Provident Farm Collective is driving at, and, and that's what we're looking at. But without that, still we're looking at the youth because of we have a cultural connection. There's a disconnect between the kids that we, we born here and we ourselves because most of our kids really don't know about farming. And now we try to introduce farming. We want everyone to understand that farmers are aging out. And right. we need young farmers. Where would the young farmer come from? They were Provident Farm Quality is working on. The young farmer is from the new generation. Okay? Why can't we teach them? How can we empower them to be actually a farmers? Like my daughter, my daughter Kuban, who have never farmed before, who knows nothing about farming, but because of Provident Farm Collective now, she works alongside with me within the summer youth program, and she begins to develop interest, and now working alongside with me, and looking at her as a future of the new farmer, which want to change the dynamic of farming. So not only... Uh, making farm, but we're looking at the future of creating new farmers that we can empower them. Look, farming not just for old people alone. It's not just for people who with certain color, but with your young age, you can still you can still farm. You can still make an impact, and that's why we try to work on so that our kids can have the self acceptance, the confidence, and the sense of belonging that they all belong to the community, and they can be a farmer. So the idea here then is this, with this capital campaign is to secure this land and keep it as part of the, the Providence uh, yeah, uh, Farm Collective moving to forward. It, to call the place home. From 2021 to 2022, you doubled your produce output yes. at that farm. Mm-hmm. Can, it get, can there be more? Can, is, there, is there more? Can you get more out of the ground than, than what you've already gotten? Yes. Yeah? Yes. And Unequivocally, no doubt. No doubt. Okay. Yes. How, we, how much do you think you can get? Uh, uh, next year, we might even, if not tripling it, we might quadruple it <laughs> because we have so much interest. The amount of applications we have received have exceeded almost the first, the second, this is our third year of t- just incubator farmers want, wanting to come to farm at PFC. Uh, folks reaching out, hey, I... Uh, I'm applying for this. Can I get it? It's like, hell, we have limited land right now. We have 37 acres. Right. 
And if we accept you, we accept you. If not, unfortunately, but we are working. We're working very hard. So yes, it definitely the output will increase. And uh, and increasing output, in, uh, creating incomes for folks. Also, farming, as Dow mentioned, um, we have folks that come to farm at PFC, and they will tell you that, hey, you know, uh, since I started farming here, I went to the doctor, and the doctor said my cholesterol level went down, my high blood pressure went down, and it's not from one person, not from two people. A lot of the farmers express the same thing, that their health, their well-being is getting better. At the CSA, when I hand out produce to our customers, a few people that can say, hey, since I start, I joined the CSA program, I've seen a change. My health has started improving because I eat fresh produce. So, yes, our farmers are getting income. Our farmers come out and do what they love, but also in turn, they are improving their health. And I am a self, I'm a witness to that. I, I am the markets manager and I farm at PFC. I tell people I work seven days a week, but I feel like I'm not working a day, in my, an hour in my life because I love what I'm doing. If I'm not the markets manager, I'm farming. They see me I'm there all day. <laughs> it, it, it's just it's the connection that folks get. So then make yeah. your pitch for the, the capital campaign. What, what do we need? What, what do, who are you trying to connect with? We have people that want to farm. And land access is not easy anywhere. I came to realize that. And with all the developments that are going around the country, it's hard to keep land to be a farm in perpetuity. That's why PFC has partnered with the Western New York Land Conservancy to purchase the 37-acre land and keep it as a farm land in perpetuity for anyone that wants to farm. Uh, so we are in a capital campaign now that ends in December 31st. If anyone is interested, they can visit us at uh, our website at www.providencefarmcollective.org. And we are also on Facebook with the same name. And folks can see what we do and how to support us. And even how to join our CSA, our Community Supported Agriculture uh, Program. And we should also mention that the, and we've been mentioned this before, but the Providence Farm Collective is out on Burton Road in Orchard Park, Road, just off of Newton Road, if I'm not mistaken, right? Not too far off of Newton, right? Right. And close to um, the uh, park, uh, the very famous park. Chestnut um, Ridge. Chestnut Ridge mm -hmm. Park, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can, I know folks, if they drove by, they would see, well, it's probably, the land's been pretty much picked over by now, right? Yeah. But uh, the idea that, if this is not a farm, like you said, land access mm -hmm. is becoming more and more difficult, that could easily become another housing development out there. But you you believe it should be farmed. Oh, yeah, it should be farmed. And it should be farmed because it will help to bring fresh food and culturally relevant food in Western New York. And again, we actually letting everyone know that food is medicine. And I'm not talking about your primary doctor. Probably the farm will be your second doctor. <laughs> <laughs> the, food we gave, the food we gave you is fresh. And just nothing you can do. You can beat it. You can beat the price. And we had over 20 different types of crops that grew at Providence Farm Collectives. So we invite people to come to the tour, come and see what is happening there, go on our website, and... Learn more about us and make us your friend. That's why we're in this campaign. But actually, our 275 farmers right now at Providence Farm Collective want to make that place a home. And when our land is bought, PSC actually going to protect it to make sure that it can remain farm land forever. You ready to follow up, Palo Hamadi? Yeah, and with uh, what we grow, it might be cultural tra or traditional foods to us, but even to some people, all the... Pro I didn't know you could eat a green uh, green tomatoes. Uh, people buy green tomatoes. They bring them to market. Certain people come and buy them in bulk. This is what they eat. 
uh, tomatillos. We grow tomatillos, bring them to market. People come and get them. We donate them. Uh, one of the food pantries, one time we didn't take tomatillos to the food pantry. And they're like, oh, what happened to the tomatillos? Like, oh, you guys like them? Oh, yes, we came here every day to get tomatillos. <laughs> <laughs> so supporting Providence Farm Collective, it supports the farmers, but also it supports the communities around Buffalo. It comes from one community to the other communities, helping support one another. Yeah, and how about we, in the future, we're looking at to kind of replicate the model that not just Western New York, mm -hmm. because we are so unique in what we do. So we kind of want to move on to Rochester, Utica, whatever. The, if people can learn from Providence Farm Collective, come on board. Come and just learn. Come and, and, and see. Come for tour. And then we can be able to pass some of those knowledge over to you and see how best we can produce fresh food and culturally relevant produce in your community. The Providence Farm Collective. That's what we're talking about today. And our guests have been Hamadi Ali and Dal Kamara. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO. Check out the Our Town series produced by WNED PBS, but captured by community members on the Buffalo Toronto Public Media YouTube channel. Ellicottville is a town of variety, not only in what they have to offer, but the people. The Burlington community is uh, becoming increasingly multicultural, and the library is reflecting that. Parks and playgrounds have been what makes the town of Tonawanda a great place to grow up. The series began in 2003, but it's making its debut on YouTube now. Although some of the businesses and people may have changed over the years, the spirit of these wonderful towns remain the same. We just didn't realize what we had in our own backyard. We need the next generation to protect it and carry on. Learn about Jamestown, Burlington, Welland, East Aurora, and more than a dozen other beautiful communities in our region by watching the Our Town series now on YouTube. I, w I would live there. <laughs> There are a lot of great ways to spend $8 a month and get a blue check mark. So why not become a member of WBFO, your NPR station? You'll be a verified member on the spot and your money will support high quality news and information. For fun, we'll send you a snazzy window cling and a travel mug, both with our logo and the blue check mark that shows everyone you're a verified member of WBFO. Just call 1-877-456-8870 or go to WBFO.org to make your pledge. Thank you. This is Buffalo What's Next, where we have conversations with the community about moving forward. To have your voice heard, press the Talk to Us button on the WBFO app, and we'll work to get your questions and comments on the air. Join us on Twitter at WBFO or email us at news at WBFO.org. Together, we'll have the conversations that are needed. This is WBFO, your NPR station. And good morning and welcome back to Buffalo What's Next. And uh, part number two today, we're going to be talking with Ed Coban. Ed, uh, we've got a couple of different elements to go with with Ed here. Uh, he's a mental health counselor. He is also uh, a, a musician and uh, a very accomplished one at that uh, uh, with a lot of focus on Native American music as well. But also, was re this is the reason why we reached out to Ed initially, he was uh, the music director for the, uh, uh, the North American uh, uh, Native American Music Awards, I should say, that were scheduled for Niagara Falls. But unfortunately, like everything around here, got <laughs> weathered out last weekend. But uh, appreciate your time, Ed. Thank you. I'm glad. Thank you for having me. We've got a lot to talk about. it, And I let's just I, I want to start the conversation with the focus on the Native American Music Awards in this sense. What is is there a Native American music sound or scene? Well, the, there definitely is a Native American music scene. OK, um, and there, there is a sound in the sense that a lot of that native music incorporates many of the, some of the traditional native instruments and themes that are underlying. But um, you know, there's Native American opera singers, there's Native American hip hop, metal bands. It's not just the traditional, like powwow type music that people, uh, you know, associate Native American. Things with. we've seen in the movies from the '50s and exactly. '40s and such. Yeah, right. Exactly. And and Ellen Bellow and Donald Kelly, um, who run the Native American Music Awards, that's been their I think the goal is to kind of illuminate to everyone that this is a, a thriving contemporary music scene that covers every genre, and but the themes will often be the same. You know, they deal with a lot of the issues and 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 problems and topics that are popular in Native culture. Um, and when it comes to that, it's interesting that Niagara Falls is going to be the place to host that 
what what's the the source behind that that brings that to Niagara Falls? Well, that's that, that's a good question because initially, um, it's it, you know it would travel around the country. It, the the first awards was in two thousand, I believe, in in New York City, and then it went out in the Southwest for a while. It was in Florida, in uh, Minnesota area, or or uh, like Milwaukee, Wisconsin, sure, the, and area. And then in, you know the mid the mid two thousands, they they came here for once. I think the Seneca's just. You know, it was a popular thing, and the Senecas brought it here, and they just kind of found a home here. The Senecas did a great job hosting it for everyone on the location, being that a lot of the brain trust of the Nammies comes from New York City, so it's easier to travel here. Um, and then um, when we started using the house band in 2010 with me, and I live in the falls, and slowly just kind of my band performed there that first year, and then got to know the people, and next year they asked if I could come perform with one performer, and then can you work on this song with someone, and then... I became the house band, and this year I was the music director. But uh, the uh, the depth of musicianship here in Niagara Falls, like no matter what what we needed, I could call on a musician here in Buffalo, native or non-native, to come and help us support that musician at the show. And the depth of of musicianship here in Buffalo is, is unbelievable. So I think that was a big draw too, you know, and it was just a nice comfort zone and we got really comfy here and I'm glad because I live here. Right. So it's great, you know. And of course, the Seneca Nation, uh, the idea that this is something that they wanted to bring here. Yeah, they, they I, from the way I understand, they kind of pursued it. You know, they went down to the Seminole Hard Rock down in Florida where they were having it and pitched it to Ellen and she 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 said yes, and it's been kind of a happy place ever since. And I gotta say, this weekend with the weather postponing everything, it was supposed to be on Saturday night. You know, the the storm hit, people couldn't get in, and people were stranded here. And the the Senecas put people up, made sure everyone had food to eat, and she took great great care of it. And we ended up pulling the show off on Monday night, like, and it it went fantastic. <laughs> like you know, it was uh, amazing how well it went considering everything. So you know, the Senecas have been wonderful hosts. Your journey, uh, your music has taken you a, a lot of places, and I love those kind of journey stories. But for you, not just a journey across the country, uh, playing in different places and, and meeting interesting people, but also it took you into this field of mental health. It, it did. Um, so I, you know, I er, initially my first introduction to playing in the native music scene because I, I, you know, I just grew up right here around Buffalo, and it's not like there's a thriving native music popular music scene, at least there wasn't at the time. And I was just at open mic, and a, a guy named Dr. Daryl Tonema, who's also a musician, just asked me to come play some shows with him. And went like three months later, we played the 2002 Winter Olympics. You know, so it, just, it was really cool, you know. But he was also a mental health counselor, and in the process I would – or a psych, psychologist, actually. Okay. I'm a mental health counselor. But he uh, – and he's one of the reasons I went to, to get that degree. Um, he would – we'd travel around the country working with youth and – um, called the Music as Medicine program. We'd work with some at-risk youth, and I became aware of some of the the issues that were happening in Native community. Most, the one that affected me most was the high rate of suicide amongst Native youth. And there was an incident where there was like a a large mass suicide amongst some of the kids that he had worked with up there, and that just hit me. It's like I gotta I gotta do something more than just play music, and went and got my mental health uh, counselor degree to try to help. So if it wasn't for me, like you know playing this open mic in Lewiston and having, you know, this well-known doctor and native musician just ask me to come play some shows with them, I don't know that I would be talking to you here today. You right. Know? How, how important is it, though, do you think, to have somebody who is Native American when it comes to mental health trying to assist people with uh, mental health issues who are Native American? Well, I, I think that's a great question. I think it's essential. Um, you know, I think one of the things I've learned, that it's it's – there's many different aspects to being native and there's many differences amongst natives from like if you're a, if you're say you're a seneca you have a diff it's a whole different world than being a, a navajo you different parts of the country different now how many stories. you told me how many communities the well there, communities? there's over 650 something different native languages spoken in the, the this country you know and so there's that many different tribes not of all of them may even be recognized by the government you gotcha know? but uh and there, some of them are vastly different cultures. There's many similarities, but you can, there's no one size fits all approach to it. So I feel that like native, each native community, it's best, especially with some of the issues that native people face that are really native centric. Like you know, other outside cultures don't even know that some of these problems exist. And so I think it's important that native people are taking care of native people because it's always been what we've had to do anyways. You know, it's always been it's been left up to us. Sure. And uh, I think that 
you know, Native people are learning that, and we're seeing a big, not a big swell, but we're seeing people start to, to give back to their own community, go learn about mental health, and then come back and try to apply it in a Native way to that particular community and their beliefs and cultures and understanding of it all. When it comes to mental health, and we've heard this in different forms through the years, that sometimes the biggest but maybe the biggest hurdle. Most certainly the first one is just getting the idea that make it culturally acceptable to say, I need some help. Sure. Is that, that the case here as well? Well, I would say, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, considering the, the, the traumas that, that some of the generations up to just recently have gone through with the residential schools, for instance, you know, um, everyone I know that, 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 that lives on a reservation, they have a relative and that's probably still alive today that survived the residential schools tragedy there was a horror um we see a lot in the news about it in canada because it, they're they're doing a lot of you know finding of the the, the, the children's bodies and stuff right. and and that that raised some awareness to it but it, it happened here in the united states too and we're just not we're just not looking to prove it you know and, and let's let's just you know, we, we, we could probably do a lot of shows on just the boarding <laughs> school and, and i hopefully we'll be getting to those or that issue as we move forward here but just generalize if you could some of the things that happen to people on the in these boarding schools that are still traumatic inside communities today well there's well first there's the actual physical stuff and mental sexual abuse that happened um you know without getting too graphic you know there was it was essentially rape and and neglect you know and physical abuse mental abuse it was like being in a gulag or in a concentration camp they weren't there to learn it wasn't a school they were there to, to work, and, you know. They made clothes, that, and then or whatever they product they would have them making at any particular school, and then that would be used to to support the school, you know. So they were it was and it was just to destroy the culture, try to get the Indian out of them, and they would, you know, they would come at when the, these were young children. And a lot of times, if they made it all the way to young adulthood, that's when they went home. So you were totally removed from your culture. You were told your culture was bad. You were removed from your family. And this happened generation after generation. So when that, that tends to just destroy the, the, the family dynamic, you know, and it, and uh, there's so many problems that come along with that, that there's a high suicide rate amongst Native youth that is like 80-something percent higher than any other culture. We have missing and murdered Indigenous women on a daily basis, much higher than any other demographic. Diabetes amongst the community much higher than any di- di- any other demographic, and a lot of it does come to the traumas of the residential school type type you know traumas, and that being that it was never talked about because the 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 elders would never speak about it, so that would always lead to issues where no one knew what to do about it, and so I feel like to get back to your question, um, that it's it's essential that native people really acknowledge what happened and when you when you can't talk about it you can't heal from it and it's but when it's something like that it's very difficult to talk about and you did mention the elders did not want to talk about it is that changing a little bit now well i think that not so i i don't feel like there's a whole lot of elders more willing to talk about it but i think their descendants are i okay. think the, the people who see what happened and understand and see the trauma manifesting in them through historical trauma that they're more willing to speak about it. It, it's, it didn't happen to them, but it's happening to them in the sense that they're, they're dealing with the aftermath. And, you know, they see that what happened to their grandmother. And, you know, well, there was one time one of my friend's grandmas, like, we, we, they asked her about it. She said, yeah, you know, they gave me new shoes. That's all she said. I got new shoes. Mm. And that's all she would ever say about it. But, you know, it turned out the things that happened to her were, you, you don't want to hear about them on the air type of thing. You right. know? So it was tragic. But the abuses were profound and all the way down of every ilk, you know, the, and it's just kind of unspeakable. And when you think about some of the the people who've gone through that, like Jim or uh, Jim Thorpe, the greatest musician or athlete to ever live. Sure. You know, he, he was a residential school survivor. Uh, Wes Studi, that actor that we all know and love, you know, plays all part residential school survivor. The, every single one of the... Navajo and other code talkers who who went through these residential schools. Right, that's, were, that, you know, we were talking about that before. There's such irony in in yeah. that. Well, just go through that. Well, yeah. So you know, I, every single one of the resident or the Navajo or you know Indian code talkers that that helped win World War II by using their language to confuse the 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 enemy, the Germans and the Japanese. 
um, they all went to they all went through these boarding schools and were, were had the language beaten out of them. They were told it was bad. They were if they spoke it, they were punished. And then it was used to in the wars. And they were, you know, it was like, oh, this is a great thing. And it is a great thing, but that's also you try to to take it away from them. And so the irony of that. Now they're heroes, you know, and they are heroes. Sure. But, but you know, for there's a certain there's a certain bit of you know it just it's sad that the one aspect is so ignored while the other aspect is so glorified when you really the, the connection between the two is pretty profound we're talking with ed coban uh, this morning on buffalo what's next uh, ed uh, was, is the music director for the uh, native american music awards postponed to this past weekend uh, due to the to yep. the, the well, snow. we did have it on monday oh you it did have it on monday, postponed, until yeah, monday. Post- postponed until monday uh, but um also as a uh, mental health counselor as well what about you know i mean we get you know we can talk about problems and we can get into this and we can talk about these lingering issues which are extensive and and you use the word profound let's look at it from the other side of the, the coin what are people missing what is the general american culture missing about the native american culture that should be embraced that could be embraced well uh, a couple things but most i think most importantly that it's 2022 in native america as well you know it's there's there's this disconnect with the reality of native america as opposed to you know people's perception i think the the people who aren't familiar with it they think there's people still think you know teepees are how where every native person lives and they have this kind of movie idea of dances with wolves kind of indian native american and or they have this kind of poverty drunk reservation Indian and it and it's there's so much in between all that and you know the the native the native youth on on every reservation out there you know they have playstations they will they like hip hop <laughs> you know you know what I mean but they just also, like me right, exactly but they also live in a culture that's kind of isolated and they they live within that as well so like if you're in if you live on a reservation but you also Live off, you know, exist off a reservation. You're living with a foot in two different worlds, and it's it's sometimes it's tricky to to balance, and it's a it's a culture shock. And for people who say grew up on a reservation in this very tight knit community to leave that and to go into the non native world, it it can be a it can be a culture shock that actually is another mental health issue. It's like a lot more than than the, it's a very different world in many cases, but it's very same similar at the same time. It's very it's it's very Tricky balance. Sure. What about then on the other side of the coin then? Uh, like I said, what should I, the general populace know about this? What, what can people do? How can, what, what steps do you think would make, would help make this reality uh, um, improve it to a certain extent? Like I think there's always that sense that, you know, we don't need your help. Okay, right? right. And I understand that. But at the same time, in this particular program, we're trying to, you know, build a bridge sure. to certain types of things. How can we make those steps? Do well, you think? I think by listening. All these, every issue that that we've spoken about this morning or going to speak about, have been talked about, and Native people have been trying to tell people for a long time. The residential school situation, in particular, it, it's never been a secret. Like it's it's just been ignored, and uh, you know, with the with the finding of the things that happened up in Canada. Uh, and, and the different residential schools, how they're they're finding the remains of all the the children who died at these things, it raised a little bit of awareness. But I, I, like I was speaking to you earlier, when I went to college and would write on this, my professors had no idea, none, right. to where they would have me kind of come in and teach the whole class about these situations. And you know, it's it's ever, in Native America, it's not a secret. It's not a it's a very on top of all issues type of situation talked about and understood. You step off that reservation, not a person knows, and it's that's a hard that's a hard thing to. So I guess listening, like listening to what people and, you, are, and, and you believing th- it, and, you know, like, and, and not and, just going what, right. you know, but like saying, you know, listening and opening your mind, not think of, get the stereotype out of everyone's mind, and kind of listen to the way it is right now in 2022 for everyone. And it's interesting because like when you were talking before about the boarding schools, and you you shared an experience. This is off air. It was fairly graphic and. My eyes almost, I think you made a comment about the expression I made because, like you said, listening. Th- that story might be out there. You could say boarding school and it, it has a negative connotation. But until the, the specifics are unraveled, right, I mean, there, there's a long way to go there. Yep, and there, it's, it's, you could do a, 
a quick Google search of Native Residential School tragedy, and it you won't be right. It'll, you actually wish you didn't do it because it's it's it can be that it, it's almost unbelievable. You know, what I mean, it is it is you know Holocaust level tragedies. Mm. Uh, we're talking with Ed Coban. We're coming down to our last uh, couple of minutes here, Ed. It's, it's flying by real fast. We had a lot to talk about here. Let's get back to the uh, Native American Music Awards then. Uh, they Somehow you got them off <laughs> yeah. amidst the snow yep. and everything like that. Uh, how about some of the highlights? Well, one of the coolest parts was um, our founder, Ellen Bello, who's been tireless champion of Native musicians. And she's a non-Native, which I think is, a, you know, interesting because she she you know early in the 90s she came across the native group she worked in the with the the grammys and stuff over the years and different things like that and um was kind of moved she got involved with them a little bit and kind of moved with their causes because the music was trying to help the community and over the years she just using her skills and abilities and just strength of will she put together the native american music association which led to the the whole award so and her husband without her knowing we had a little trophy made up and kind of presented her oh, in nice. the middle of the show, which is great because she's in the back. Like, if you go off the script, it makes her nervous. So it was kind of, <laughs> seemed, well, it was a beautiful moment, you know? Right. But also we uh, recognized Mickey Free, who's a really well-known guitarist. He's played with Shalimar and kind of immortalized in a, in a Dave Chappelle skit with Prince um, <laughs> over the years. And he won his Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, the great Orrin Lyons, he was a, he's a orator and just a very influential um native personality who's met with you know world of world leaders and stuff over the years and just a lot of his words and writings are very very respected and he was given a, a lifetime achievement award um sten jody um who was known for his role on the reservation dogs new tv show um he won artist of the year uh, my friend cody blackbird won best rock recording with a you know, with uh Gary, we were talking about right. with Steve Miller Van, and uh, it, and just the fact that the Senecas actually gave us the ability to pull it off. Um, they took care of the whole. They took care of everyone who was stuck here. They they made sure everyone was fed. They got everyone in and out. They didn't they didn't they didn't stutter to to step up and really make sure the whole thing went off. And it was it was great. It was, a band called Hallucination also, which is big in Native country. They performed and just just knocked it out of the park. Um, Back to Niagara Falls next year, or is that not yet decided? Well, it, it hasn't been decided, but you know, it usually, uh, I, like I said, I'm I'm not part of that whole d- discussion. Sure. But, you but know, you're ready to go wherever it, they yeah, need I you to go. I live here, so I love that it's here. You know, but wherever right. it goes, I'm willing to go. Yeah. And what about your music? What, how can we check you out? Um. Well, I, you know, my I have an album out called How to Fly, and uh, it was put out in 2015. Available on Spotify and Amazon and YouTube, like all the all those streaming outlets, and. Uh, it's a mix of like contemporary music with native flute and some more traditional styles, and it's it's a very eclectic album. It, it couldn't, it doesn't fall under any one genre, which I think was probably a problem. <laughs> 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 you don't know what you don't know where to where to line it up, you know. Right. So we uh, we go to Spotify just under Ed Coban, uh, K O B A N. Yeah. That'll get us there. Absolutely. Okay. And it's called How to Fly. Yes, sir. All right. And um, how about for you, uh, your musical development? Is it how much have you been influenced by Native American music? Well, you know, more than I thought going, like, you know, I grew up just listening to 70s guitar gods in rock music, you know, everyone from Jimi Hendrix to Judas Priest and ACDC. Um, but when I started getting into the Native music scene I, and finding out, the, you know, how many contempt like Jimi Hendrix was his mom's Cherokee, he was half Cherokee, you know, and... Uh, and just the, 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 like, for instance, I got to spend the weekend with Earl Slick, who played with, who was at the Wards, who played with David Bowie, John Lennon, and Mickey Free, who's played with Prince and Shalimar. And these are guitar gods, you know, and they just, I spent the whole weekend watching them play, talking gear with them, and, and then listening to me. And it was just a big, it was, as just a music fan, it was, a, it was cool. I was fanboying the whole weekend on top of being surrounded by the best musicians in Native America. It's like, you know, I couldn't ask for a better gig, you know. Ed Coban, you got to come back and talk to us again, okay? Oh, I would love to. All right. Thanks Ed, for having me. Oh, absolutely. Ed Coban with us uh, this morning on Buffalo What's Next, uh, part number two. Earlier, we talked to Hamadi Ali and uh, Bao Kamara uh, from the Providence Farm Collective. And, of course, we'll have more for you. No show tomorrow. Uh, Thursday is, of course, Thanksgiving. You'll have uh, Turkey Confidential here on WBFO. Back with the uh, producer's picks 
on Friday uh, show. And then, of course, a whole new Buffalo What's Next next Monday. This is Buffalo What's Next on WBFO and WBFO HD1 Buffalo, WOLN Olean, and WUBJ Jamestown, your NPR station.